In this lecture, you'll learn about the ONTAP 7 mode architecture. 7 mode is a legacy operating system from NetApp that isn't available anymore. So if you're wondering, well, why am I covering it here then? There's a couple of reasons for that. First reason is that there's still a fair amount of 7 mode systems out there in the field. So it's good to understand them because of that. And the second main reason is that to understand the current clustered on tap architecture and why it works the way that it does, it really helps if you know about the seven mode architecture first. On tap used to be available in two different modes at the same time. That was seven mode and cluster data on tap which is also known as cluster mode or C dot for cluster data on tap. The current implementation of on tap is the clustered version. Both modes did exactly the same job. That is acting as the operating system and controlling everything on the storage system. And when you bought a FAS hardware platform, you had the choice you could either buy it running as seven mode or running as clustered. Because it's the operating system, it's one or the other, you couldn't run them both at the same time, you had to make a choice. Seven mode evolved from NetApp's original operating system that was data on tap 7G. And cluster data on tap evolved from the acquisition of Spinnaker Networks in 2003 and data on tap GX, which came about because of that. Now, you're hopefully wondering why would NetApp have two different operating systems doing exactly the same job running on exactly the same hardware? That seems kind of strange, right? Well, the reason is that there was a limitation with both versions. Cluster mode was more scalable than seven mode, but the early versions of cluster data on top were limited in features compared to seven mode. In versions earlier than 8.3, NetApp released on tap in both modes and customers made the choice. They either chose to deploy the full feature set support of seven mode or get the scalability of cluster mode, but they couldn't get the best of both worlds. We had to make a choice at that point. NetApp worked towards having one operating system which did provide the best of both worlds and they worked on achieving feature parity for cluster mode in each new software release. And from version 8.3 of ONTAP, they achieved that. So now there is just the one version, which is the clustered ONTAP, that has got the scalability and it's also got the full feature set as well. So now you don't make the choice, best of both worlds, you're gonna be running cluster data on tap. And because there is only one version now, they've simplified the naming and it's simply known as on tap now. Okay, let's have a look at the architecture of seven mode and then you'll understand why it's got limitations as far as the scalability goes. So we've got the controller. The controller, also known as the head, is the brains of the system. That's where the CPU and the RAM is. It's also where the operating system lives. And on the controller, we've got our physical ports there that connect out to our clients and also to our disk shelves. With some models, you can have internal disk shelves in the chassis, but you can span out the capacity by adding additional external disk shelves. So let's add those next. The connection to the disk shelves, that uses a SAS connection and the connection gets daisy chained. So we have a port on the controller is connected to a port on the back of the disk shelf. And then that disk shelf gets connected to the next disk shelf going down in the stack. The maximum amount of shelves you can have in a stack depends on the model of controller and shelves that you're using. Now, if you look at the diagram here, you can see that there's a single point of failure there as far as the connectivity to the disk shelves goes. If any of the cables fails, then we lose connectivity to all of the disks below that. So to get redundancy for the connectivity to our disk shelves, we have a second connection going down 
to the bottom shelf in the stack. Now, if any one single cable fails, we can still get to all of the disks in the system there. Okay, next thing is there's another obvious single point of failure there, which is the controller. So you can run on some models of fast systems with a single controller, but real world, typically your data, your storage is going to be mission critical. You're not going to want to have any single points of failure. So for that, you will put in another controller to give you redundancy for your controllers. Now, a quick note here, looking at the diagram, in most of the modern platforms, two controllers fit inside the same chassis. But in the diagram here, to keep things simple, each controller here is a single controller. Okay, so it's one chassis, but there's a single controller in the chassis. So over here on the left, we've got controller one and it's disc shelves. And over on the right, we've got controller two and it's got its own disc shelves as well. Now, obviously we're gonna need to connect them to get the redundancy. We want the, the disks, the data on the disks to be available if either controller fails. So to enable that, we can connect controller one to controller two's disc shelves. We connect it to the top shelf in the stack, that gets daisy chained down. And again, we've got that second connection, that's our MPHA, multi-path high availability connection. And we also need to do the same thing from controller two going to controller one as well. So now if either controller fails, we've still got connectivity to all the disks with all the data on there. We put another connection in, between our controllers, that's the HA, high availability connection. The controllers send each other keep alives over there. So if the keep alives aren't received, the controller will realize the other controller must have gone down and it will take over. Okay, let's look what happens under normal operations. So you can see here under controller one, we've got a set of data, data set one, which is owned by controller one. In ONTAP, both 7 mode and the current clustered ONTAP as well, the disks are always, always owned by one and only one controller. Now, the ownership can move if need be, but the disks are always only owned by one controller at a time. So you can see here for our data set one, it's on disks which are owned by controller one. Controller one is connected out to the network where we've got the clients. Whenever a client comes in, to use that data, the incoming network connection is going to terminate on controller one. With seven mode, for a single set of data, the networking is active standby. The connections are always served by controller one for the disks that it owns, and this controller two is always going to serve the connections for the disks that it owns. For data one, we do not have active active load balancing with connections hitting controller one and controller two. They always hit controller one. If controller one fails, it will fail over to controller two, but it's active standby. And here you can see that controller two also has its data as well. So we've got data set two, which is owned by controller two. And obviously, whenever clients come in to access data two, that is going to be served by controller two. Controller one is the standby unit. Okay, but what happens if we do have that controller failure? So here, controller one fails. When that happens, controller two is going to stop receiving the keep alives over the HA connection. So it realizes controller one has gone down and it needs to take over ownership of its disks and data. So when that happens, controller two will take ownership of controller one's disks. So you can see before that data one was owned by controller one and data two was owned by controller two. When we have a failure of controller one, controller two owns data one and data two as well. It takes ownership of data one so that it can serve it for the clients. The network connections also fail over to controller two as well. Now, because of this, because we can have failures, it's recommended that you do not put more than 50% load on either controller. Because if you did, if you had the controllers running at 100%, well, when there was a failure, it would now be trying to serve at 200%. It can't do that, so performance would be severely degraded. So to keep acceptable performance, recommended, don't run more than 50% load on your controllers. 
Okay, so that's how the architecture of seven mode works. You'll see when we do the next lecture that clustered is very similar with one major difference, which overcomes the limitations of seven mode. And what those limitations are is there's a maximum of two fast controllers can be configured as a high availability HA pair and managed as a paired system. With seven mode, you can only have two controllers in the same system. Disks owned by controller one will always be accessed through controller one. It does not do active active load balancing for the same set of data. It does active active load balancing for different sets of data, but not for the same set. There's a limit on the maximum amount of disks and throughput that can be handled by a single node. So there's a performance limitation there as well, and you can't scale out a seven mode system. It's limited to two controllers. You could scale out by purchasing additional HA pairs, but they would be managed as separate systems, which is obviously going to be inconvenient from an operational point of view. It's easier to manage one system than it is to manage multiple different systems. They also appear to clients as separate systems as well, which again is going to make it more complicated to manage from an operational point of view. Data can be moved easily and non-disruptively between disks on the same controller in seven mode, but moving data between the two different controllers in the HA pair or between different seven mode systems is disruptive to client and more complicated. Okay, so those are the limitations of seven mode. You've seen the way that the architecture works as well. In the next lecture, I'll cover the cluster mode architecture and you'll see how it overcomes those scalability limitations. Thanks for watching. If you want to get hands-on practice with NetApp storage, you can download my free how to build a NetApp lab for free ebook. It's got full step-by-step -step instructions on how to build a complete NetApp lab and best of all, you can run it all for free on your laptop. And if you want to get my complete NetApp course, which covers everything you need to know about NetApp storage, you can check out the other video that you can see here too. Thanks.